Um, so today we're going to talk about uh, cystic diseases of the kidney, but mainly we're going to focus on polycystic kidney disease and acquired renal cystic disease. So just an overview, we'll start out with briefly uh, going over the classification of renal cystic diseases, uh, talk a little bit about cyst histology, and then uh, talk about polycystic kidney disease and acquired renal cystic disease. So <coughs> cystic disease can be classified as either uh, genetic or non-genetic. Uh, common um, uh, genetic diseases that we see are uh, autosomal dominant polycystic kidney disease and uh, uh, von hippel lindau and tubular sclerosis. And then uh, non-genetic diseases, common ones that we see are acquired renal cystic disease, simple cysts, and uh, MCDK. <coughs> this table uh, highlights the fact that with uh, genetic cystic diseases, uh, most often they're associated with, uh, with other anomalies and the uh, genes have been mapped to uh, certain chromosomes in most cases. Uh, for example, in the uh, polycystic kidney disease been mapped to chromosomes uh, 16 and 4 and also in uh, tuber sclerosis uh, shares chromosome 16 with uh, PKD1. Uh, this is in contrast to <coughs> non-genetic cystic diseases where there's typically not any uh, associated anomalies. Uh, so what is a cyst? Uh, the kidney is the most common organ to form cysts and they're microscopic or macroscopic sacs lined with epithelium. One definition is a dilated duct greater than four times its normal di diameter. And cysts can uh, be formed from any part of the nephron. So we'll move on to talk about uh, autosomal dominant polycystic kidney disease. We'll talk about the epidemiology, go over the genetics and pathogenesis talk about screening issues, how to make the diagnosis, uh, manifestations, mostly focusing on the renal man manifestations, and then moving on to talk about the uh, complications and uh, management of the complications, and then discussing some of the transplant issues. So it's uh, present in one in 500 to one in 1,000, depending on what series you look at, um, and it's the most prevalent monogenic disorder. Uh, most are identified clinically when the patient's between 30 and 50 years of age, but the age at diagnosis is uh, decreasing as genetic testing becomes more prevalent. Uh, the d disease is known to be slightly more progressive in men, and it accounts for 3 to 15 percent of patients on renal replace replacement therapy and between 3 and 13 percent of uh, renal transplant patients. So there's, <coughs> there's three uh, genes thought to be involved and two of them are well characterized, uh, PKD1 and PKD2. <coughs> PKD1 is found on the short, <coughs> short arm of chromosome 16, 16P13.3 uh, to be exact, and it accounts for 85% of cases of polycystic kidney disease. Um, it's uh, the more aggressive form of the disease associated with an earlier onset and faster progression it encodes for, uh, the gene encodes for polycystin 1, which is a glycoprotein uh, thought to be found uh, in, on the cell membrane and thought to be uh, found in the uh, primary cilium. Patients with uh, PKD1 have an average life expectancy of uh, 53 years. In uh, PKD2, uh, the chromosome, uh, chromosomal defect is on chromosome 4, 4Q21. It accounts for 15% of cases and has a slower progression and later onset. Um, it's also a, a membrane protein thought to be uh, a calcium channel. And the average life expectancy for these patients is 69 years, which is uh, significantly longer than PKD1 patients. Uh, this is just a picture of where these uh, proteins are thought to occur, which this is a uh, <coughs> tubular epithelial cell this is a primary cilium projecting into the tubular lumen, and these proteins are thought to be present in this, in this structure and may be responsible for uh, uh, cellular orientation. Uh, polycystic kidney disease is an example of two uh, genetic phenomenons. One is genetic imprinting, uh, where the disease uh, may be more severe and manifests earlier when it's transmitted from the mother and as well genetic anticipation where subsequent generations have earlier onset and severity of disease, although this isn't necessarily the case in all, of, all cases. 
There's great inter and intra familial vari variability, uh, which is thought to be due to a number of different factors, perhaps a variability in where the <coughs> mutation is located in the gene. Uh, the two hit uh, phenomenon where uh, one uh, gene is uh, mutated and um, during the course of the patient's life, uh, the um, other normal gene may become mutated. Uh, and as well, there may be some genetic and environmental uh, uh, modifiers which have yet to be characterized. And some of this data is um, uh, taken from studies of uh, monozygotic twins. Cyst histology, so the cysts range from a few millimeters to several centimeters, um, up to 10 centimeters or larger. Uh, they're diffusely spread throughout the cortex and the medulla and may <coughs> be derived from any portion of the, of the nephron. And epithelial hyperplasia is a common feature. Epithelial hyperplasia is found in uh, several other uh, cystic diseases, in acquired renal cystic disease, in VHL, and in tubular sclerosis. But in contrast to those uh, disorders, uh, there's no increased risk of RCC in uh, polycystic kidney disease. In the uh, other disorders, there's uh, a very significant increased risk of RCC, particularly in VHL, um, but also in uh, acquired renal cystic disease. Um, <clears throat> now, screening uh, for polycystic uh, kidney disease. Uh, there's two major modalities uh, that are used for screening. One is imaging using ultrasound, and the other uh, is genetic testing. There's two types of genetic testing which can be used. Uh, linkage analysis, which requires uh, blood tests in uh, unaffected and affected family members. And there is a direct DNA test offered now. What are the potential benefits of screening for polycystic kidney disease? Uh, probably the most important uh, benefit is the identification of possible kidney donors. Uh, this is probably uh, where genetic testing has its uh, greatest utility. Also, potentially for family planning, um, early detection of some of the disease uh, complications such as hypertension and then the treatment of those uh, complications. What are some of the possible detriments of screening? Well, there's the psychological issues, especially detecting the disease in uh, uh, children. There's educational and career implications as well as insurability issues. Until effective treatments become available, the adverse effects from pre-symptomatic diagnosis in children outweighs uh, the benefits. Um, this is from a recent uh, review article. So the uh, ultrasound diagnosis for uh, someone known to be 50% at risk uh, depends on their age. In patients younger than 30 years, uh, you need to see two unilateral cysts or bilateral cysts or one cyst in each kidney. In patients 30 to 60 years, uh, two cysts in each kidney. And in patients greater than uh, 60, four cysts in each kidney. Uh, to contrast, uh, normal ultrasound values uh, for age have been described. In someone aged 15 to 30, less than 1% have unilateral or bilateral cysts. In the 30 to 50 year age group, 1.7% have unilateral cysts and 1% have bilateral cysts. In 50 to 70 year olds, 11.5% uh, have unilateral cysts and 4% have bilateral. And this goes up to 22% in patients uh, greater than uh, 70 years old and 9% have bilateral cysts in that age group. I agree. I, I, I usually, uh, I usually uh, have thought that someone that's 50, 50 years old would have a more like a 50% risk of having a cyst. But I'm not sure what, what the cutoff size was, but that's a good point. And I, uh, when I reviewed this, uh, I thought uh, the incidence would have been higher in those age groups as well. A interesting study in radiology uh, looked uh, at the sensitivity of ultrasound for polycystic kidney disease. And what they did in this study is they used uh, genetic testing for patients that were at 50% risk of de developing the disease. Uh, they had a single ultrasonographer um, uh, look at uh, ultrasounds before the genetic testing was done and uh, uh, try to diagnose um, polycystic kidney disease based on the, uh, these criteria uh, developed by Ravine. Uh, 
and they found that ultrasound has uh, very good sensitivity and specificity, particularly when patients are above uh, the age of 30. But overall, for uh, PKD1 and PKD2, uh, in all comers, the sensitivity was uh, 97% and the specificity was 100% using uh, ultrasound for screening, so it's a very good uh, test. And it's uh, also very good because uh, it does, doesn't expose the patient to any uh, radiation and it's cheap. So making the diagnosis in an absence of a family history, uh, probably about 90% of patients uh, have a family history, but there's, there's a, a group of about 10% uh, where it may be a new, uh, new mu mutation. And <clears throat> the diagnosis is made with bilateral renal cysts and two or more of either bilateral renal enlargement, three or more hepatic cysts, uh, cerebral artery aneurysms, arachnoid cysts, pineal gland cyst, pancreatic cyst, or splenic cyst. Just to go over the genetic testing, uh, uh, linkage studies w were the, was the first uh, uh, means of uh, diagnosing uh, someone using genetic testing. It could be done with both the PKD1 and PKD2 genes, and it basically identified flanking uh, uh, genes the downside is that it required uh, blood samples from at least two affected family members and two non-affected family members uh, to use uh, linkage analysis. Uh, there is uh, direct DNA testing now. Uh, one such test is offered by Athena, Athena Diagnostics, and it basically uh, sequences the uh, uh, PKD1 and PKD2 genes and um, uh, compares the sequencing with, uh, with the sequence of the known uh, mutations and it's very um, sensitive for picking up uh, mutations. On the uh, Athena Diagnostics website, they listed potential indications for genetic testing. Uh, I'm not sure if everyone's going to agree with these, but I thought I'd um, uh, put them up uh, for interest sake. Living donor evaluation, which I think is very reasonable, <clears throat> but uh, they also listed unclear clinical diagnosis a typical presentation without family history to differentiate between uh, PKD1 and PKD2 mutations, which I guess would have some implication as far as uh, disease prognosis is concerned, and then prenatal diagnosis. So we'll move on to talk about the renal manifestations of polycystic kidney disease, which are mainly hypertension, pain, end-stage renal disease, infected cysts, stones, and hematuria. So hypertension is present in 5 to 40 percent of children, 50 percent of patients between 20 and 35 years of age and normal renal function, and essentially 100 percent of patients with uh, end-stage renal disease. And it's now become the most common uh, form of presentation, which used to be uh, hematuria. Uh, the etiology of the hypertension is not fully understood. Uh, but it is associated with uh, increasing renal size. It's perhaps thought that stretching of uh, renal vessels by enlarging cysts creates distal ischemia and activa activation of the renin angiotensin system. It's also known to be associated with atherosclerosis. Uh, PKD1 and PKD2 proteins have been found in vessel walls, and it's thought that perhaps there is some impairment of nit nitric oxide-mediated vasodilation in vascular smooth muscle. And it's also associated with insulin resistance, which is known to be a risk factor for hypertension as well. Associations with hypertension include reduced renal blood flow, abnormal sodium handling, and remodeling of renal vasculature. And hypertension has some pretty serious implications. Uh, it can cause left ventricular hypertrophy, which results in diastolic dysfunction. It can cause a worsening of mitral valve prolapse, which is present in a significant number of uh, these patients. It can cause a worsening of aneurysms <coughs> or a bursting of these aneurysms, uh, res resulting in intracerebral or subarachnoid hemorrhage. Uh, hematuria. It's also well characterized as a major risk factor for ischemic heart disease and MI. It can cause a worsening of uh, proteinuria and chronic renal failure. And in women, there is an increased risk of preeclampsia and fetal loss. Uh, this was a paper which compared uh, ACE inhibitors to calcium channel blockers, uh, looking at blood pressure control, uh, effect on creatinine, and effect on proteinuria. It was a randomized control trial. Uh, there was no placebo group. 
and they studied uh, polycystic kidney patients with a creatinine clearance of less than 50 cc's per minute. What they found was there was no difference in uh, blood pressure control or creatinine at one or five years. However, in the patients treated with ACE inhibitors, there was a significant uh, decrease in proteinuria at both one and five years. A uh, recent meta-analysis which looked at several papers comparing ACE inhibitors to both calcium channel blockers and thiazides uh, showed the same thing that ACE inhibitors do not uh, improve uh, renal function or hasten the renal decline, uh, but they do uh, decrease the uh, onset of uh, proteinuria. So with hypertension, early detection is important and uh, perhaps uh, ambulatory, monitoring, uh, ambulatory blood pressure monitoring should be used. As I discussed, ACE inhibitors are better than calcium channel blockers or hydrochlorothiazides at reducing the uh, proteinuria. The optimal blood pressure is unclear, but likely these patients should <coughs> try to uh, keep their blood pressure under 130 over 80. And there's an ongoing trial right now uh, looking at uh, these issues, um, looking at ACE inhibitors versus ACE inhibitors plus ARBs and looking at what the optimal uh, blood pressure uh, control point should be. So <clears throat> of most significance for uh, urologists is uh, um, patients that present with pain. This is probably the most common symptom. And pain can be attributed to a number of different causes in polycystic kidney disease, such as uh, infection of cysts, stones uh, causing pain or renal colic from passage, uh, hemorrhage into a cyst, clot colic, uh, pressure on the renal capsule or adjacent organs. And when someone presents with pain, you also want to think of GI issues such as heartburn, diverticulitis, <coughs> which is more common in these patients. And there have been some case reports of pancreatitis, which has been missed um, because um, physicians uh, attributed the patient's uh, pain symptoms to uh, uh, pressure on the capsule. Now there's a number of different uh, treatment modalities for pain, ranging from uh, non-invasive to fairly invasive. Um, the most important um, principle with pain management is first uh, identifying uh, treatable causes such as calculi or infections. Uh, the least conservative, or the most conservative way to treat is just using analgesics, and caution should be used using uh, NSAIDs in these patients. Um, Many groups have tried percutaneous cyst aspiration with uh, injection of various uh, sclerosing agents. Uh, some groups have used uh, embolization, but this should only likely be used in patients that are already on uh, hemodialysis or perineal dialysis. Um, laparoscopic or open uh, cyst unroofing. A recent paper also described uh, laparoscopic denervation and nephropexy. And the most invasive treatment for pain would be uh, nephrectomy, either unilateral or bilateral, and we'll talk about all of these things. Uh, so the first paper I looked at was uh, looking at uh, using 99% uh, ethanol uh, combined with uh, cyst aspiration. It was a pilot study from uh, India uh, performed over a one-year period, and uh, they uh, percutaneously aspirated these cysts and then injected 99% ethanol and followed uh, patients' uh, pain scores and creatinines as well as serial imaging over the year. Uh, the selected cysts were greater than five centimeters and uh, apparently exerting, uh, were thought to be domi the dominant cysts because they were exerting uh, a pressure as characterized on IBU or contrast enhanced CT scan. So the average uh, cyst size that they treated was uh, 3.4 centimeters and uh, the average uh, uh, volume of alcohol that they used uh, was uh, 50 cc's. Uh, they calculated the volume of uh, ethanol that should be used based on the cyst size and also based on what was thought to be the toxic dose, even though um, really a small portion of this eth ethanol is absorbed systemically. They had a fairly high complication rate, which is a little bit unexpected. One patient actually developed a nephrocutaneous fistula uh, that required placement of a double J stent um, and took uh, a month uh, to heal up. And uh, they thought that their cure rate at one year was 80%. Um, so the uh, decrease on the um, uh, visual analog pain score uh, 
at one week was fairly significant, going from 6.5 down to 2.3. Uh, one concerning um, feature of this study was that the creatinine increased uh, from 1.9 to 2.1 over the year, and that was a st statistically significant increase. And it's unclear if it was the ethanol itself that perhaps damaged some normal renal parenchyma, or if this was just the natural progression of the disease. So just to reiterate, the, yeah, pa the pain score has improved. However, the creatinine uh, increased, which was somewhat worrisome. Now, various uh, sclerosing agents have been used. The most common is 99% uh, uh, ethanol. Um, other sclerosing agents include n cyanoacrylate, which is a, a substance designed for sutureless wound closure, uh, ethanolamine, uh, povidine, acetic acid, dextrose, uh, tetracycline and monocycline, uh, phenol, bismuth, and fibrin glue, as well as glucose. So moving on, um, uh, we'll talk about uh, cyst unroofing procedures. Uh, historically, in 1911, Rob Singh was the first to describe uh, unroofing these cysts surgically in three patients to relieve pain. However, um, a number of these, pa these patients were noted to have deteriorating renal function, and so the procedure lost, lost its enthusiasm uh, however, in the 1950s, two large series um, looked at uh, cyst unroofing again and felt that there was uh, significant pain relief with uh, cyst decortication. However, in 1957, uh, Bricker published a paper in the New England Journal uh, uh, showing uh, two of his patients which had worsening renal function after cyst decortication, um, and the procedure was basically abandoned for the next 20 to 30 years. This is a, a table from the AUA update series uh, looking at um, this very historically various series uh, that described um, uh, cystic cortication. Uh, there's a couple of things that struck, struck my eye when I looked at this. One was that some of these procedures had very high mortality rates. Um, and it's probably because a number of these cysts were infected and uh, they didn't have uh, uh, the same antibiotics that we do. Uh, today, so I think a lot of these patients died of infection postoperatively. And as well, um, there's some pretty interesting indications in some of these series, such as in Goldstein's series, the indication was prolongation of life, which I thought was pretty interesting. Now, in the 1980s in uh, China, there was several lar large series which looked at cyst decortication again. And um, uh, this repopularized uh, this approach. And in 1992, there was a large sing uh, series by Elzinga which uh, looked at um, cyst uh, decortication again. And uh, this was a series looking at both patients with uh, pain and renal insufficiency, or both. It was a prospective study, and uh, unilateral or bilateral cyst reduction uh, was performed. And the patients were followed for uh, 21 months this is a Kaplan-Meier curve looking at um, the durability of the uh, pain response. And essentially they found that at uh, 12 months, 80% of patients were still pain-free. And at 24 months, uh, there was still about 65% of patients which were pain-free. Uh, one criticism of this study would be that they uh, did not use a um, objective uh, measure of pain. Patients, were, patients basically reported to the physician over the phone or in the office if they had pain relief or not. They didn't use uh, any sort of a visual analog uh, pain score. Uh, one of the main uh, um, objectives of this study was to see if uh, cystic cortication uh, did in fact have an in impact on uh, renal function as reported in previous studies. So in patients that already had um, renal dysfunction, um, uh, they plotted a, a graph showing the slope of the renal dysfunction. And this uh, solid line right here is the time of surgery in these patients. So as, as you can see, there was no real impact on the slope. Um, there was one patient who had an improvement in their renal function and one patient who had a worsening of their renal function. But all in all, the surgery did not uh, adversely impact the uh, or hasten the uh, 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 renal decline. So their conclusions uh, were that it was effective uh, for leaving pain in the majority of patients. The pain uh, 
uh, relief was fairly durable, 65% at two years. And in those patients who had their pain recur, it was less intense um, than preoperatively. So their conclusion is that there is no deleterious effect on renal function, but there is no improvement in renal function either. Um, and uh, they also found uh, that in uh, unilateral cases, uh, the kidney that was actually treated uh, did not differ from the kidney that was not treated um, uh, for renal function. They compared DMSA before and after, and uh, there was no difference uh, between the two kidneys on the DMSA test, which was interesting. So with the success of the uh, open um, uh, cyst marsupialization, uh, several groups uh, went on to look at laparoscopic cyst uh, marsupialization, including uh, Dr. Tyson there. And a, um, a large series, uh, which I'll go over, uh, was by uh, Dunn and Clayman uh, and reported in the Journal of Urology in 2001. And they looked at 15 patients who had either uh, unilateral or bilateral uh, cyst marsupialization. And these patients were followed uh, for blood pressure, pain, um, and creatinine, and uh, they actually used a subjective uh, or an objective measure of uh, uh, pain control using uh, analog pain scores, and they were followed for 2.2 years. Um, so the uh, main indication was pain, 100% of patients had pain, but significant number of patients also had other symptoms as well. Their mean operative time was pretty long, 5.5 hours. Um, however, they, they had minimal blood loss. Uh, they also treated a large number of cysts, 200 cysts on average. And the mean hospital stay was 3.2 days. So they uh, achieved uh, comparable results to the uh, large open series we just talked about. So 73% of patients had some response and the, the mean response was uh, 60 two percent reduction in pain. Um, when they looked at hypertension, there was no real improvement in hypertension. Uh, several patients had worsening of their hypertension. Several patients had improvement, but most patients had no change in their hypertension. Uh, same thing with the, um, uh, the serum creatinine. Uh, what they found as well was that patients who had bilateral procedures had a better uh, pain response than patients who had a unilateral uh, procedure, 83% versus 67%. So in summary, they had a 73% uh, improvement in pain at 2.2 years. Um, in responders, the mean improvement was uh, 62%. Um, in patients that did fail, most of them had late failures, so they had some response early and then um, uh, most of them failed several months or greater than a year afterwards. And uh, Patients who were treated with a bilateral procedure had a better result than unilateral. There was no effect on hypertension or creatinine in this study. Um, now, most of these laparoscopic series have a surprising number of complications, uh, major complications. One of the most common is uh, a urinoma, and um, uh, this series was no exception. Three patients developed a urinoma, uh, which did respond uh, to placement of a double J stent for four weeks. Um, in this series, they actually attempted to uh, discover if there was a uh, urinary leak intraoperatively. They placed a, uh, a ureteral occlusion balloon catheter at the start of the procedure and injected indigo carmine uh, post-op. Um, but it sounds, they didn't explain this in detail, but it sounds like that wasn't enough to uh, uh, show the leak. And these patients still developed a urinoma post-op. They compared the results to uh, the large open series that we talked about, and the results uh, were comparable as far as pain control was concerned. However, the LAP series uh, did have a longer OR time and an increased uh, percentage of complications compared to the open series. This is another uh, large uh, series looking at uh, LAP uh, decortication. And essentially, they, they had the uh, similar results. 100% of patients uh, were treated, uh, uh, had chronic pain. Uh, what they found in this study was that there was a trend towards imp uh, more improvement in patients who had a larger number of cysts treated. And they looked at overall QOL and found that there was improve an improvement in uh, every domain of uh, uh, quality of life scores in patients that were treated. Yeah. 
That's why there are OR times where it's six hours in some cases. <laughs> And they found they had pain results comparable to other studies. Again, this uh, this uh, series had a significant number of complications. Again, three patients developed urinoma that responded to stent, and um, uh, I won't go over the other complications. There was no change in hypertension as well in this study. No improvement or decline in renal function. Uh, however, there, there were a couple of serious uh, late complications. One patient developed a uh, abscess six months post-op that required a nephrectomy, and um, one patient ended up dying, uh, but this was a year after the procedures. This was an interesting study recently published in the Journal of Urology looking at renal denervation and nephropexy. They looked at um, adolescents uh, aged 15 to 19, four patients who had pain refractory to narcotics, and the mean follow-up was uh, 12 months, and they used an analog pain score. Um, so the preoperative pain scores were pretty significant in these patients, ranging from 6 to 9 out of 10, and they found that at um, a discharge and a mean follow-up of uh, 12 months, they had a fairly durable uh, uh, pain relief. This is a procedure that's also been performed in uh, loin pain, hematuria syndrome. Uh, minimal complications, but one patient did have a renal pelvic leak requiring stenting for six weeks. So their conclusions was that renal denervation is a feasible procedure with good short-term results, and uh, a long, but a longer series with longer follow-up is required before um, any definitive conclusions can be drawn. So now we'll talk about uh, end-stage renal disease with polycystic kidney disease. On average, it occurs between the fourth and sixth de decade later in PKD2 than PKD1, and once it begins, the average uh, rate of decline is 5 cc's per minute. 50% develop renal failure by the sixth decade. Uh, the etiology is not completely understood. It's interesting because only 1 to 2% of nephrons uh, actually develop cysts. It's thought that perhaps pressure atrophy may play a role, or perhaps um, uh, there's uh, vascular remodeling. And some groups have found that there's increased apoptosis in nephrons in these patients. Uh, some of the renal uh, dysfunction may be from analgesic nephropathy as well because these patients use a large amount of uh, pain meds. Now the risk factors for end-stage renal disease include uh, PKD1 uh, type, uh, being male, African-American, having early onset hematuria, having early onset hypertension, hyperlipidemia, low HDL, sickle cell trait, smoking, or a rapid rate of cyst growth. And some groups have found that multiple pregnancies also increase the uh, risk of uh, renal decline. How can this be prevented? Well, ACE inhibitors have been shown not to decrease the rate of renal decline. However, they do slow the rate of proteinuria, and it's known that uh, cyst marsupialization also has no effect. Uh, so infected cysts, Most cyst infections occur in women in 90%. Uh, they're thought to be mostly ascending infections with E. coli, Klebsiella, Proteus, and Pseudomonas. Uh, urological instrumentation is a major risk factor. And uh, one of the reasons that these are hard to treat is because um, uh, there's poor antibiotic penetration into the cysts. Um, most of these cysts are separate from the actual uh, a nephron, and so the antibiotics uh, do not reach the cysts uh, by being uh, filtered. They have to actually penetrate, uh, penetrate the cyst, and that's why uh, lipophilic antibiotics are the uh, antibiotics of choice, and the common uh, antibiotics used are fluoroquinolone, septra, and chloramphenicol. And in refractory cases, percutaneous cyst aspiration is required, and if that doesn't work, uh, nephrectomy is needed. We'll move on to talk about stones in polycystic kidney disease. There is a much higher incidence of stones, five to, time, five to ten times the incidence in the general population. 30% overall develop stones, and 20% are symptomatic. And essentially, contemporary endourological management is all that's required. These patients don't need to be treated differently than any other stone patients. And um, calcium oxalate and uric acid stones are the uh, most prevalent. Talk about hematuria, very common in polycystic kidney patients. 50% of patients overall have hematuria at some point. Uh, 
It's the presenting symptom in 25%, and hematuria is associated with uh, worsening uh, uh, renal function. This is an interesting paper I came across looking at um, successful treatment of life-threatening hematuria using transexamic acid, uh, which is an anti-fibrinolytic. Uh, it was a case report from Europe, and essentially this patient um, had refractory bleeding uh, causing uh, instability despite bed, bed rest and 10 units of uh, blood. And the patient was uh, booked for the OR, uh, but the hematologist um, uh, got their hands on this patient and infused uh, 20 milligrams per kilogram of transexamic acid while the patient was awaiting the OR. And uh, essentially the bleeding uh, promptly stopped and uh, 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 ceased uh, with no recurrence after that. They uh, continued the transexamic acid for two months and at 24 months there was no recurrence. So transexamic acid is a plas plasminogen inhibitor and so it's an antifibrinolytic, antifibrinolytic agent and it blocks lysine binding sites on uh, plasma molecules. Um, it's a fairly new drug. Um, it's used during orthopedic and cardiac surgery and it has been used for uh, bleeding duodenal and gastric ulcers and it may be something that uh, could be considered in these patients. Um, it's known that urokinase activity is high in cysts, and this um, causes hyperfibrinolysis in these patients. And as well, some polycystic patients are thought to have systemic hyperfibrinolysis as well. Uh, so we'll talk about transplant issues in polycystic patients. Touch on when to consider transplant, when to consider native nephrectomy, the timing of native nephrectomy, and then uh, post-transplant issues unique to polycystic kidney disease. When to consider transplant in these patients, GFR less than 10, creatinine greater than 800, or symptomatic uremia. And potential indications for native nephrectomy would include chronic pain, hypertension, cyst infections, a suspicious renal mass, uh, GI symptoms most commonly would be early satiety, um, no room for a renal allograft is one of the more common indications, uh, respiratory compromise or recurrent uh, calculi. So the rate of native nephrectomy in these patients has decreased over the last three decades. It was a very, common, very common to perform this procedure in the 1970s where 85% of patients had a native nephrectomy before transplant. Um, however, it's uh, decreased over the last uh, 30 years uh, and now in most contemporary series only 20% of patients have native nephrectomies uh, before or at the time of uh, transplant. Um, this is likely due to several factors such as uh, improved antibiotics for treatment of cyst infections, uh, better pain control and some of the uh, minimally invasive techniques such as uh, percutaneous aspiration and laparoscopic cyst unroofing that we talked about. The current consensus is to avoid native, native nephrectomy if possible. Um, it's known that in patients that retain their native kidneys, they have less complications on dialysis. Um, there's been shown to be improved survival on dialysis. Uh, these kidneys continue to produce erythropoietin. And uh, these uh, nephrectomies aren't always easy and um, can sometimes result in massive blood loss requiring transfusion and subsequent sensitization. Uh, we'll talk about the timing of native nephrectomy. Uh, uh, many groups um, um, uh, have looked at this. Um, this is a paper uh, from the Journal of Urology looking at concomitant uh, uh, nephrectomy and renal transplant and comparing it retrospectively with renal transplant only or staged uh, nephrectomy either before or after. And they looked at perioperative complications and if there is any uh, uh, effect on creatinine compared to the uh, three groups. Um, this looks at the patient demographics. Most of these patients were living-related transplants, except in group three, where they were all cadaveric transplants. And uh, there is a fair number of complications in uh, these series, including a duodenal cirrhosal tear, and there's a couple of patients with uh, liver lacerations. Um, the liver can be uh, huge in these patients and hard to retract. Um, in the group that had a concomitant um, uh, nephrectomy and transplant, uh, the operative time was quite a bit longer, almost eight hours, and uh, there was uh, uh, increased blood loss 
Uh, however, there was no adverse effect on post-op creatinine. So their conclusions was that uh, there was increased blood loss and transfusion in concomitant nephrectomy and renal transplant. However, there was a lower complication rate and there was no difference in graft function. And in the uh, concomitant group, there was no delayed graft function where there was a case of delayed graft function in the um, uh, stage group. Uh, they also thought that patients were more satisfied to have one surgery uh, compared to two surgeries, um, although they didn't use any um, uh, objective measure of this. This is another group which looked, uh, compared three groups, those having pre-transplant, concomitant or post-transplant uh, nephrectomies. Um, and again, they looked at perioperative course, OR time, blood loss, and creatinine. Um, the main indication in the uh, uh, pre-transplant group uh, was pain, uh, whereas in the uh, uh, concomitant group, it was uh, mainly pain or size. And then in the uh, post-transplant group, most of those patients uh, were nephrectomized for uh, recurrent uh, cyst infections. Essentially, they found no difference between the three groups and complications, blood loss or hospital stay. And their conclusion was that concomitant native nephrectomy is safe and does not compromise graft function. And it has similar perioperative mor morbidity compared to pre or post. Uh, so in summary, regarding the timing of native nephrectomy, um, it's best to avoid nephrectomy if possible, especially in patients on pre-dialysis, obviously. Um, concomitant nephrectomy is safe and feasible and probably associated with greater patient satisfaction. Um, concomitant nephrectomy avoids dialysis and pre-dialysis living donor patients. And in patients already on dialysis, concomitant nephrectomy um, avoids the increased uh, risk and, and morbidity of being anephric while on dialysis. This paper looks at some uh, issues unique to um, polycystic patients after renal transplant. And um, essentially there is uh, three things that um, you need to be aware of in patients with polycystic kidney disease who've had a renal transplant. One is that they have a higher incidence of diverticulitis and possible perforation. Uh, they have a higher incidence of arachnoid hemorrhage, but interestingly there's no increased risk of uh, uh, CVAs overall. And some patients may require uh, phlebotomy for erythrocytosis. So we'll briefly talk about acquired renal cystic disease, uh, switch gears here. We'll talk about the description, epidemiology, diagnosis, histopath, symptoms, and transplant issues, and most importantly, the association with RCC. So the description, cyst forming in non-cystic failing or failed kidneys. Uh, it was originally thought to be a phenomenon related to hemodialysis only, However, it's been shown that hemodialysis and peritoneal dialysis patients are equally affected, as well as patients not on dialysis who uh, just have end-stage renal disease. And it's been shown that kidneys usually shrink after dialysis starting. It has started, but then after three years, that's when they uh, usually start to enlarge and develop cysts. Uh, so the incidence, 8% of patients have uh, acquired cysts at the start of dialysis. And by three years, 50 to 60% of patients have um, uh, cysts. Um, at 10 years, basically 100% of patients have cysts. And there is quite a uh, male to female uh, predominance of these cysts, uh, 2.9 to 1 ratio. Risk factors, the main risk factor is the length of time on dialysis. Uh, these other risk factors are debatable. It's, it's unclear if males are at higher risk than females or not. And it's unclear if uh, Africa, African Americans are affected more than Caucasians, although most studies have shown that they are. And nephrosclerosis has been shown to be a risk factor as well. Uh, the diagnosis is uh, typically one that can be made on ultrasound, although if there's a suspicious mass identified, you uh, need to proceed with contrast-enhanced CT scan. And uh, several uh, diagnostic criteria have been published, but most would agree that greater than three cysts per kidney is required to make the diagnosis. These cysts are several millimeters to several centimeters in size. Uh, and the pathogenesis is unclear, but it's thought that it could perhaps be due to ischemia uh, epithelial sloughing in tubules or blockage by crystals and there's probably um, some uremic growth factors or some sort of a substance which is not clear by dialysis which has yet to be characterized. Uh, complications, um, pain, hematuria infections but most notably the increased risk of malignancy 
Um, now, our, uh, we'll talk about acquired renal cystic disease and transplant. Um, early transplant may prevent uh, development of uh, cysts. Cysts may regress following transplant, but some groups have shown that cysts may still develop after transplant. Um, the risk of RCC does fall after transplant, but it's still higher than the population risk. It's still 0.5 to 3.9% at a mean of six years. Um, and as well, uh, in the setting of chronic rejection, the allografts can again become more susceptible um, uh, to forming cysts. Now, most notably, uh, the most uh, severe consequence of this is the association with uh, RCC. The population incidence of RCC is 0.04%. Uh, however, in um, uh, patients with acquired uh, cystic disease, it's uh, 3 to 20 times the population risk, uh, depending on the population which has been studied. And overall, there's a 1 to 3% prevalence of RCC in the dialysis population. The incidence increases with time on dialysis. Now, most of these RCCs in the setting of end-stage renal disease are associated with acquired cysts. Uh, 20 to 25% of end-stage renal disease with acquired cysts have adenomas. And uh, when RCC develops in end-stage renal disease, it's associated with acquired cysts 80% of the time. And the prevalence of RCC in the setting of end-stage renal disease plus acquired renal cystic disease is anywhere from 2 to 7%. And the mean time on dialysis is uh, 8 to 9 years. So it's a late phenomenon. Um, interestingly, the RCC in these patients is different than the RCC in typical patients. It occurs at a younger age. It's more often present in males. Um, the incidence is higher. The tumors are typically smaller. Um, they're less likely to have metastasis at diagnosis, 15% versus 30%. And they do have a less aggressive course and better prognosis. Uh, the papillary subtype is more common. It's 50% of cases. Uh, in this setting, whereas in uh, typical RCC, it's uh, 10 to 15 percent of cases, and tumors are more often multi are multifocal. Uh, it's not entirely clear what the pathogenesis is, but it's thought that there is uh, uh, epithelial hyperplasia uh, relating to unknown uremic related growth factors, which leads to undifferentiated tubular growth and then increased risk of mutation. Uh, we'll go over this picture there. Um, so this is a uh, article from Human Pathology looking at the proliferative activity of RCC in acquired cystic disease and comparing it with typical RCC. They looked at S phase, ploidy, and uh, proliferating cell nuclear antigen. Um, patient demographics were fairly similar. However, a major flaw of this study um, is that in the um, uh, typical RCC group, uh, the tumors were quite a bit larger than in the uh, uh, RCC group associated with uh, acquired cystic disease. Uh, so it's sort of like comparing apples to oranges. And um, uh, in this group, as in other series, they found that the uh, uh, papillary uh, subtype was about 50%. Um, so 100% of the RCCs associated with acquired, acquired cystic disease were diploid, whereas uh, only 56% in the typical RCC were diploid. And um, uh, in the uh, typical RCC, there was a higher uh, fraction, or there was a higher PCNA level indicating a higher um, uh, malignant potential than in the uh, uh, acquired uh, RCC group. So in conclusion, the histological characteristics correlate with observation that RCC in acquired cystic disease is less aggressive than typical RCC. And as I mentioned, a potential flaw of this study, however, is that they compared tumors uh, that were quite different uh, in size. Um, and I'll just touch on screening for acquired uh, cystic disease. Uh, and this is a very controversial um, uh, topic uh, for a number of, of reasons. Um, one is uh, the potential cost of screening. Does the cost of screening all dialysis patients uh, outweigh the potential benefits? Um, in dialysis patients, there's a significant risk of dying from other comorbid conditions. So um, if we screen all these patients, are we actually going to uh, make a difference or not? Um, what screening modalities should be used if we do screen patients? Um, when to start screening? Should they be, started, uh, should they, they be screened immediately starting dialysis or um, uh, at a certain time level? And um, 
what is the life expectancy of dialysis patients in, in a particular region? In Japan, for example, uh, patients do much better on dialysis than they, they do in the U.S., so perhaps these, those patients should be screened and the patients in the U.S. shouldn't because they have a shorter life expectancy. And before you screen someone, you have to discuss, decide if they're actually candidates for uh, therapy or not. And finally, should these patients be continued to be screened after transplant? Now, proponents for screening uh, would say that patients should be screened uh, starting dialysis, uh, so you have a baseline imaging study, and then they should be screened starting three years afterwards, which is the time when acquired cystic disease really starts to take off and the RCC risk really starts to take off. And most would, would say that they should be screened every year or every other year. And if there's a suspicious lesion on ultrasound, then you should proceed with the contrast-enhanced CT scan. And obviously, the longer the patient's on dialysis, the higher the positive predictive value of screening. Um, ultrasound is the most cost-effective and the least uh, morbid. Um, however, uh, this, is, this isn't by any means um, uh, a slam dunk, and it's still a very controversial issue, which we don't have time to get into.